I'm based. I'm based. I'm based in Clip Town. That's where 1955 is Clip Town, South Africa, Chobek. So, um, I'm a I'm an artist. I do a whole lot of I do a lot of, of visual work around Soweto, Chobek. I install art and also do small movie documentaries. And then yeah, so. I'll talk about Clip Town. Clip Town is a is a small community that's Clip Town is is a small community that is made out of thirteen communities surrounding each other and divided by a railway line that's dividing the whole community. And Clip Town is the community. We really lacking a whole lot of stuff, like we lack sanitation, basic services, and then and hence we came up with 1955 a, a creative collaboration, which is an we call ourselves a creative collaboration, collaboration and a social advocacy in 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 in. In, in aiming and uplifting the community and empowering, uh, empowering the community of Clip Town as a whole. The community is facing big challenges. I mean, like I just said, we're a community that has a high rising number of unemployment, lack of services, and the community yeah, we are. We don't, we really don't like to call ourselves a an informal settlement or a shanty community or a ghetto. In a way, even that, even though we are a ghetto ourselves. Yeah. So, um, Clip Town is a is a very is a very strict community. I mean, Clip Town coming from an apartheid system and where it's a where Freedom Charter was drafted, of which is the constitution of South Africa. As 1955, we had to come up with plans how we wanna portray ourselves or how we see ourselves. So 1955 in Clip Town, we got this award from the UN inhabited and block by block of which you want uh, this global award in coming up maybe we presented a good idea or what but basically 1955 and Krypton as a community we won this magne uh, big big mag magnificent opportunity that we can come up with a skate park but not just a skate park a flood medication skate park that will empower the kids of Clip Town. For instance, we have young kids who are building these beautiful bikes that they go to showcase them around. And we have we have kids who are skating in a rubble in a way. <laughs> there isn't any space for for them. But I mean, you can't stop people from, especially kids, from having fun. And with all of that, it brings us to, 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 to why we are here today, everyone, and everyone joining us, discussing, discuss, having this discussion about how we will, we, will we move on or how will we make Clip Town a better community? Because me coming from Clip Town, a community that is that is underprivileged and having to work with you guys who are professional and whom we really regard fairly high, you know, it's it is a privilege on its own. I mean, besides the concepts of westernization and its ideologies, but I think as a community and as a nation, 
we can assist each other and learn from each other or try to empower or uplift each other in working together. So um, Christine is showing us few, few slides, images about Clip Town as a surrounding. So on the, on the image is showing, this is the whole community of Clip Town, which is divided by the railway line within the center. I'm sure you can see there's a railway line dividing and then at the bottom, it's where I stay, we call it Temba Westboro of which we have a big, a big clip refer. It's one of the biggest rivers in Chogaka, I could say. Yeah, and we've been having challenges of the floods within, within the river, coming from the river and within from the upper side, since we're at the bottom of the community as well. So, the community has challenges of receiving amount, amount of water, especially in this hot season, like now it's raining. I'm sorry, you won't be able to hear me well, but yeah. So we have these continuous floods that are happening within Clip Town. Maybe can you go further, Christine, with the slides? So this, in, this is an example of, of the floods taking place at the bottom of the river. Um, I'm a photographer, so I took this image while we, we experienced floods. So this is how the, this is how far and extensive it can get within the flooding system and or flooding duration within of the year around Clip Town. And this is where I stay. This is my community of Union Road. As you guys can see, literally we no longer have a road. You know, I was telling Veronica now and Christine that we have this big challenge, big challenge as a community since Union Road is our main entry and exit point. So we don't have any we don't we really don't have any cars going coming in and going out and there's a community that uses the public toilets that requires to be drained so we're really having a big challenge because some of the people's toilets they haven't been drained since the two weeks of the rain because i'm sure if you guys have heard it's raining badly in south africa and we're exper experimenting severe floods around so but as like i'm saying as 1955 or why we really advocate advocating for this uh flood medication as you can see this in this slide or images we're at the bottom of our community this is where we asked our counselor to bring us a, a TLP because the water will flush down Union Road down to where the TLP is, of which it's the it's our big river, the Clip River. And then we we really we really think this is important for us as a community because this maybe will prevent the water from an upper part even at the lower part of the of the river just to make that that boundary line you know within the community and the and the river or where the community starts or where the community ends and the river starts christine maybe can you go further yeah so so yeah um Clip Town and 1955 Skate Park with the UN inherited block by block. And yeah, guys, we we really we really appreciate your your efforts and coming to coming into into the table and trying to really develop uh, or help us or see or see why 
or how we can collaborate in in this project and bringing change in about the community of Cape Town as well. And yeah, Christine, can you maybe move further with the slides? So as 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 a community of Cliptown, we in 1955 we have identified some spaces where we thought the the skate park will make sense, and where we think we're having challenges. I'm sure you can see in the slides we have like uh, highlighted where the areas where we think the the skate park could make a change or where the skate park can can take place because it's not just the skate park we also wanna wanna protect ourselves from the water as you can see we thought the skate park will make sense and protect the community as well since since i'm sure you can see from the images the river in the community they are not that far and why the skate park is relevant and how it will protect the community from from the floods and and moving on and then at the top part at the upper part of the of the images it's our freedom charter square the walter sulu square it's where our constitution lies and this is where most of the water is coming from as you can see all, all the other side the upper side is literally developed better than our side so we thought like it will be best maybe if we had a a, a flood medication or some flood medication at the upper part that will that can channel and and protect the community from 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 the damage ferric damages because the community's houses especially coming down at union road uh literally whenever there are floods those all of those houses you can see water coming up from the inside while you are inside the house. So the whole space is literally damaged. And we think with our with the skate skate park up there, it can also protect the community and also give a chance for for the kids to and the community to to be more more part of the freedom charter or to be more part of our own constitution of which we feel like we're really not being recognized especially currently under these hard situations so um the 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 the, the water comes from the upper part and it floods down whole of union road fourth street that street you know up down to the river so so there was a channel within this uh, railway line running down the community as it divided. So at the upper part, there used to be some a big trench that was was there way back. I don't know why it's no longer there, but there, there used to be a big trench that would channel the water, the water all the way next to the railway line and channel it down to the river rather than now when the water is coming straight up to the community and the community has no no say or no power of how we we can protect ourselves from this water and and the consistence flowing because we have water from the other communities coming down since we have like unbroken taps uh damage sewer pipes and then all of these letters it will it leads to the water coming down to the community and to the going down to the river so now i'd like to introduce christine christine 
you can come in. Can you hear me? I need to unmute myself, sorry. Um, thank you very much, Tavang, for that great description of the um, of Cliptown as a whole and, and what the key issues are that we um, face as, uh, as, you know, with this project. Um, as, as some of you may know, I'm the, the coordinator of the Global Studio at Athabasca University, and I'm also the co-founder um, with Tavang and our other uh, colleague, Robert Shai, of 1955 Creative Collaboration. We've worked together for about nine years now, and um, first starting with academic research and then uh, working on, on housing advocacy projects. And then we decided that we wanted to try to address some of these issues through creativity and through projects that we could control more ourselves that we didn't rely totally on the government to, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to come to the table in order for the project to move forward. Um, one of the other issues that we, we look at are the, the issues that um, the community faces given the legacies of apartheid and oppression and poverty in, um, in Cliptown um, and in the country uh, as a whole. And Tavang and um, Sechaba Mape, who some of you may have heard him speak in the Global Studio, he's, he's the local Johannesburg-based architect that's on this skate park project. And, and I, we presented our design process at the um, Stellenbosch University's third annual social justice conference on restitution. And um, the reason why we did this was to, um, to talk about this, this metaphor of the, the people who are at the design table and, um, and how the power structures within the, that are still you know, largely intact from the white supremacy of apartheid, um, how those still continue to influence who's at the table and who's making decisions. So this happens to be about our design team and our pro project. And um, this, is, this is my chair, this one that sits on top of the table because of the fact that I, you know, in, in the power structure, I, uh, I have, I'm, first of all, I'm white. I'm from the global North. I have a lot of academic education. And so I tend to be the one that people will listen to more than, say, Tavang. This is Tavang's chair, that although he is at the table, when we're talking with stakeholders and so on, they are much more likely to listen to me than they are to listen to him. And this chair here is Say Chaba's chair, and he has moved that chair around quite a lot, deciding on where he um where he feels that he should be and it and it and it's kind of continually changing with with his own conflicting um you know background he grew up in a community like you just saw in Cliptown in a town black township he he and his family were um were were pushed out of their land and and into a township and um 12 people in in a small house and and yet, you know, he has managed to to go to university, and so he he does have that, and he has a PhD, and he's a you know now working on his license licensure for architecture. So he, you know, his chair is getting closer to the table. So it's you know, and and then this chair out here is the river because we you know we we, we were talking about the idea of having, um, you know, the river having, having a voice, like, you know, in, in, in New Zealand, where they've, they've now made the river have, be, have the legal rights of a human being. 
So we were, you know, we were toying with this idea of the river actually being considered as one of the beings that has a voice at the table. And um, part of what that comes from is in the um, Southern African culture, in many of the Southern African cultural beliefs, the river has a is a being. It's not it's not just water moving on the earth. And that being is often reflected as a as a an, as a snake. And this is one of our design team members, um, Bafano Gumede, who is an artist in Soweto. He did this drawing after after we had a meeting at the river. All of us. This is us on our design team, and this is the river talking to us. And this is ancestors here. And so, you know, to begin to really look at um, what does designing within a different culture look like and what, how does one respect that? And how do you grapple with these power hierarchies? Um, and so, as you can see, that drawing is here in our design, is in our design room, as is the flooding from last year, which, um, so this is not, this is, this year is worse, but it's not a unique event. Um, but then what I wanted to call attention to is this conversation, because this is the actual conversation that went on as we were standing by the river. And Sechava asked um, the group of, of four or five of us that were at the river, if everyone could, um, he says here, each of you, how are you um, feeling being close to the river. Um, and I don't know if T, you want to jump in here and say a little bit about the, the belief of system of the river. Um, but then, but then he turned to me and said, um, you know, that this was time for me to stay quiet. And as a designer that then I stood and listened because actually it, it wasn't about how I felt standing by the river because it's not my culture and it's not my community. And, um, but, but then the thought bubble here is about me thinking about, you know, if I, if, you know, from, from all of my programming and education, if I don't, if I don't say anything, then I don't have any value on the design team. And so this sort of grappling of my own of, you know, what is my role as a white Western um, uh, member of the design team in a culture that's not my own? And um, so uh, do you want to say something, a, a few things, T, about the... the... Sure. So, um, okay. So as, as Africans, we really we really sacred people i can say you know we really believe in our ancestors and we really take our our cultural beliefs seriously so for instance um a river is one of our sacred space i mean besides besides a space where we will go as young boys in the community to go have fun to swim since we don't have any swimming pools here so the river is the best is the simplest space you can get to swim and um but the space is not only used up by us you know we have traditional healers people who, who, who church goers i mean traditional healers will go there for uh, For their traditional sacred things, church goers will will go there to for baptism. You know, so the space eventually it becomes this this sacred space or this important space within the community it's, it, itself. You know, it's not just some normal river that we take it to be. No, it 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 it, it has its own life. It has its own. Own, own own role that it's playing within the community itself in like I just said in healing us or whether it's church or or yeah but 
just to support Christine's statement. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Thanks, T. And so, you know, that 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 my own grappling becomes part of my own sort of rehumanizing in in our post-colonial time, whether it's in South Africa, whether it's in Canada or other um, countries grappling with how to deal with um, with with designing public spaces in a post-colonial um, environment. And so I and I, I don't know if any of you know um, Claudia Rankin, but I think she captures um, a lot of these issues that we're facing with designing public spaces and excuse the fact that this is actually the announcement of her of her MacArthur Award. But um, I just think she has she she captures this so well, and it's just 45 seconds. So I'm going to quickly play it. Claudia Rankin is a poet, a playwright and an essayist. I write to provoke dialogue to navigate race and loneliness and what it means to live in the world. What happens when I stand close to you? What's your body going to do? What's my body going to do? She is the recipient of both the MacArthur and Guggenheim fellowships. What does suspicion mean? What does suspicion do? She centers whiteness in order to critically engage it. What does it mean to be a black woman in the face of white male power? Can there be a meeting of our realities? Um, and I think that's a nice segue into um, some of the literature that's been written. And there's actually, um, I, preparing for this talk, I was, uh, I was really interested to see there's actually quite a large body of, of, of um, academic literature written around Minecraft and the use of Minecraft both in design and in um, and in education, and so a couple of quotes that um, that you know I think, and this is not to at all demonize Minecraft, but it's just to um, you know to to show both sides. There's the side of Minecraft that is about bringing um, you know and and the use of Minecraft in in design about bringing different um, knowledge systems into a single platform and 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 giving people the opportunity to visualize you know what they dream of what they need and so on but there's also another side to the way in which the actual game of minecraft was designed and and some of these quotes are as a video game minecraft is embedded with institutional and colonial forces um, i don't think you're going to have any aborigines in your world minecraft Minecrafting Terra Nullius. So it's very direct, um, direct parallels to the process of colonialism and um, the process of extractive resource mining. Because um, in the game, that's uh, you know that's what what one does. And so um, Tavang and I were you know talking about that, and then and asking you know what are the relationships between Minecraft and neoliberal power structure structures of spatial production because as architects you know I, I i think that's a really important question that that we ask if we're going thinking of using this as either a design or an educational tool and then does minecraft normalize dynamics of resource extraction racial violence and colonial erasure and um and finally coming from an oppressive apartheid system how does a community like Cliptown benefit from and face working and what do they face working with a, a powerful Western gaming brand like Minecraft? So we just wanted to put those questions out there for you to think about through the rest of the um, session. And now I'm going to hand it over to James and he'll talk a little bit about block by block and then um, and then we'll have a discussion amongst um, amongst all of us with a response from Veronica. Great, thank you, Kristen and Tavang, for your um, for your presentations and, and for inviting me here. I've got a bit of a flu, so ex excuse my voice, but I'll, I'll do my best to to get through. 
Um, so yeah, I have a quick 10 minute or so presentation summarizing um, block by block the organization and the methodology that we employ with Minecraft. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll go fairly quickly so we can save some room for discussion. Can everyone see the screen okay? Is that coming up? Yes, we can. Thanks, James. Perfect. Um, so the purpose of the foundation has, has probably changed in recent times. I mean, we were originally set up as a public space organization, and we were really, our main focus was um, encouraging a dialogue around the need for good quality public space design that puts the community at the center of that design, so a participatory design process. Um, whilst that's still very much our, our aim, since kind of being founded 10 years ago, there is now a lot more focus on this issue. And so what we really look at is the potential of um, digital technology and, and video games as a tool to, to make that happen. Um, so yeah, in, in summary, we use Minecraft um, as a platform to empower communities to design or redesign public spaces in their neighborhood. And then crucially, the foundation will, um, will build or help to, uh, to fund the construction of that according to the community's designs. So not only are, are we a kind of a participatory uh, approach, but we only, we do our best to take in projects that, that we can see through in partnership with the community to, to an actual construction and implementation. <clears throat> Um, we're a slightly unusual organization. We're a mix of kind of three different uh, entities. Mojang is the Swedish game developer that uh, came up with Minecraft um, over about 13 years now, 13 years ago. Microsoft bought Minecraft for two and a half billion dollars in uh, 2015. Um, and UN Habitat are really our, our kind of crucial implementing partner. This is the partner who kind of oversees the implementation of projects. They are based in Nairobi, Kenya. They travel to the sites where we're running workshops and they deliver the workshops. Personnel from all those organizations make up the, the foundation, which is really a, uh, a kind of voluntary board who help kind of promote the foundation's work, but also uh, have a bit of accountability and oversight of, of um, the Minecraft methodology. I probably don't need to kind of spend too long uh, on this with this audience, but um, you know we're passionate about the importance of public space as the the lungs of the city, the the, the places that bring not just cities but any community together. Um, we're also passionate about kind of youth engagement, and it's one of our key focuses. Um, for us, there's a certain irony in the fact that the cities of tomorrow will be sort of inhabited by today's children. Uh, but it's it's that group, those young people who are most often excluded from, from conversations around uh, urban planning and, and public space design. So this is uh, really important to us. I think we, we're passionate about the importance of the, the, the role that the technology can play in this. Um, we understand that this is not kind of the... the a, a total solution to, to this issue. I think we are very conscious of our process being used as part of a toolkit or as one of a number of processes uh, to be used to engage the community. But um, there is something specifically around Minecraft and video games that, that it has to offer in terms of visualization, sort of the quick three-dimensional sketching of ideas and the accessibility of the platform. Um, like I said before, I think you know community participation is is absolutely essential. Uh, our approach is somewhat a response to the existing kind of more traditional participatory approaches, which might include uh, sort of mapping or or drawing. And whilst they absolutely still have their their value in place uh, in the process, um, we often find that they exclude people who don't have professional training or aren't from an architectural background. And so that's one of the things that we uh, are really passionate about is, is Minecraft giving everyone uh, an equal platform or as an, e an equal a platform as, as we can we can provide. And finally, we believe in cumulative impact, not just delivering a public space and then leaving, but making sure there is a wider impact than that, um, making sure that that public space can be maintained and cared for, making sure we can have a bigger impact on the community. And actually, one of the things we try to do in our workshops is ensure that people who have participated 
gain some kind of digital skills or education that, that, that can take they can take further. Um, and also, I think, sort of inspire them to, to play a more um, empowered role in, in local government and local community uh, projects. So I'll, I'll very quickly summarize the methodology. It would start with um, sort of identifying the site um, that, that we're working on and then recreating that existing site in Minecraft as a 3D model. We will then kind of mobilize the, uh, the, the group that will attend the, the workshop, um, usually between 30 and 60 people. I mean, as broad a cross section of the community is, is quite important. So you're making sure all voices are heard. But in the past, we have run multiple workshops with different stakeholder groups, such as young people, uh, older people. We've done projects with kind of safety for women and girls or refugees. So it is quite sort of flexible and adaptable um, in that sense. Organizing a workshop, which usually occurs over two to three days. Um, introducing, and this is where you and Habitat do a great job of kind of a, a crash course on public space design. So briefing the participants on, on, the, on the basics of public space, general design considerations. Um, having a, a site visit and making sure everyone is, is obviously familiar with the real site. Having also at this stage kind of a community discussion. So before touching Minecraft, having all the kind of concerns of, of various groups represented and heard, I think is, uh, is very important. Teaching Minecraft, and, and this is, as I said, why we use it. This usually takes one to two hours. Um, I did say that this is partly to provide kind of an equal platform. That's not entirely true. There are always kind of biases embedded in technologies and how they're used. I think with Minecraft, the one we see most often is that younger participants are actually much quicker to adopt and uh, to, to sort of adapt and be able to use the game. Um, what we try and do to mitigate that is organize the groups or the teams to have representatives from sort of younger people, but also older people there. And then you have kind of a, a cross-generational exchange. The younger person can help sort of guide the, the older users on how to use the game. And the older person can, um, can share their kind of knowledge and experience of the, of the place that they're designing. Um, the kind of group, uh, community group is, is separated into small teams of uh, about two or three people. And then the majority of the workshop are each of these teams using the existing model that we've made and redesigning it. They go into Minecraft and they rebuild what they would like that public space to, to look like. Um, they will then present these models, not just to each other, but also the local stakeholders, the decision makers, architects, quantity surveyors, to make sure there is that sort of accountability there. Um, we will then kind of do a prioritization exercise. If, for instance, 10 out of 10 groups decided to build trees and flowers in the Minecraft model, we know that's a high priority uh, for the community. The architect would then take that um, combined Minecraft model and uh, use it to create an architectural plan. They will then present that plan back to the community as part of the validation process. This is one of the riskiest parts of the methodology is where architects could look at what's done in Minecraft and just do something else. But we really try to, to work hard to make sure that the community's design is, is uh, carried through as faithfully as possible. And then the, the construction, the design is built according to that plan. Uh, where we can, we work with local communities to help to help build, employ local skills um, and labor. And then finally, sort of as a broad um, mission above all that is just the, the advocacy for kind of good quality public space, for participatory design, for um, yeah, the empowerment of unheard voices in this, in this area. This is a little out of date, but um, I think we're coming up to about 150 projects now, which have been done all over the world, predominantly in the global south. Um, and we've had over two, about two and a half million people now who live within a, a 10 minute walk of a space that was designed in Minecraft. Um, yeah, and I, I won't spend too long on, on examples of projects, but you know, we've really worked with a lot of different groups. I think more recently, um, especially in the last five or six years, using Minecraft as kind of a mediator, particularly in, in areas where there are conflicts, where there might be religious, social, political differences. Um, Minecraft can really become a common language that diffuses a lot of uh, tension in those situations. Engaging people with disabilities or, um, uh, yeah, like I said, it really provides as close to an equal voice uh, to participants as, 
as, as we, we, we come forward to. Um, increasing digital and build uh, literacy and build skills, so providing the participants with actual skills that they can they can use and take away. Um, and then I think also what we often see from the finished projects is that the communities who helped design them are so much more likely to to be responsible for that public space, the maintenance of it, and play a part in its kind of evolution and adaptation. So really creating a sense of pride in, in the community uh, of the space that they have helped design um, is, is really valuable. Um, we have, in the last few years, kind of published our entire methodology so that anyone can, can read this and follow a, a detailed breakdown of the steps. Um, this is kind of a, an overview of, of the, the different steps that we take, but um, yeah, this was in partnership with you and how is that and really to make the methodology as successful as possible. Um, and yeah, I'll, I think I'll leave it there, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to having a discussion. Um, thank you. Great, thanks, James. I think um, both Kristen and uh, Tabong are maybe uh, disconnected. I know they're both in uh, in South Africa right now. Um, so maybe I'll just start off the um, conversation and uh, until they join back. But one of the things is that I really thought was very interesting was that um, you know what Minecraft is doing is, as you mentioned, is becoming a tool um, to empower people, and I think that's really a very powerful. Uh, discussion to have and um, you know in particular you said those who may not have a voice otherwise so for instance children um, or um, others who may not have the same kind of digital literacy as you mentioned um, to give them an ability to uh, participate in a community engagement process that will ultimately become the space that they are you know uh, interacting with and as part of their community um, I, you know, from my own experience, uh, I think that the pandemic um, was very challenging for many people. And I have a young child, I have two young children. And my son, who at the time was eight or nine years old, he actually used Minecraft to help him through uh, the pandemic. He uh, connected with his friends online. Uh, I had a Zoom meeting open that they were able to go in and out of, and they created their own community. And I feel in some ways Minecraft has really helped him uh, mentally to get through the pandemic um, because he was able to create communities, create um, engagement with his friends and give him uh, some power through something that was very powerless for, for many people. And that's kind of going through the community. Um, so I think, you know, those kind of aspects are just, uh, you know, greatly um, beneficial and something to be thinking of. How can we use this and other kind of opportunities um, to give people voices during community engagement that they might not be able to express what they're looking for and needing in other ways? And maybe if you could elaborate on on kind of how it's helped the, the engagement process uh, further. Yeah, sure. I, I think picking up on your point, it was interesting to see in the pandemic mainly in the global north, to be honest, lots of kind of uh, school groups and university groups using Minecraft as an alternative kind of digital public space, like a virtual forum where they can socialize and, and meet and play. Um, I think play is really important. And often we kind of struggle ourselves with defining, you know, are we are we gamifying urban design or are we bringing urban design into a game? Um, are we using a game or are we using a tool? Are we kind of taking away all the, the, the gamified, the game elements of Minecraft and just using it as a tool? It's, it's a difficult one. Um, wherever that argument goes, I think it is important that there is an element of play in what we're doing. And we find time and time again, the process of play is hugely valuable in, in kind of solving difficult problems. And public space planning is a hugely difficult problem with lots of different voices to, to consider. So we, we see that people are in a more creative, open-minded mood when they're playing, whether they know they're playing or not, right? Um, and I think more willing to make mistakes, uh, you know, games and play are typically a safe space. Um, so I think that's also worth mentioning. Um, and I see Kristen's just, just rejoined us. Um, I haven't seen the panel yet. Apologies, I have Tavong on the phone. He's... Um... Okay. We both lost network at the same time. There was this huge crash of thunder and the networks went down. So, um, 
but he also now doesn't have power. So we're going to try to sort something out. Yeah, we were and just where telling are you guys in the presentation. Uh, James had completed his presentation. We're just uh, having a bit of a discussion um, about the um, ability for empowerment. And uh, James, I think what you had just mentioned about the ability to play, one of the things I noted when you had the slideshow where uh, this, your slide where it showed the real um, photograph, the photograph of the real space, and then the photograph of the Minecraft space. I actually thought it was very important that the Minecraft space, although it was replicating the real space, it was still an abstract. And I think that um, keeping it as an abstract and allowing us the freedom to play uh, and not be too precious about, you know, some of the real kind of um, concerns that we have, especially, you know, as architects and planners, we're always thinking about a lot of the real concerns. I think allowing the freedom to just play uh, in a more abstract way is really important. And I wonder, have you seen any kind of surprising moments that came out of that kind of process in, in the projects that you've worked on? Yeah, I think a lot of the feedback we get at first is that it isn't a good design tool because it's too it's too rough, it's too blocky, they can't add detail. And that's kind of an initial kind of spike if we were to draw a graph of kind of ease of use or, or how good participants thought the program was. But very quickly that subsides as they realize it actually, the limitations and the blockiness of the game, um, it kind of frees them up. You know, they don't have to be so precious. They're not worrying about the, the texture or the materiality so much or the, you know, the precise finish as an architect would. They can really focus on the spatial layout and the, the general concept. So it's a sketch. It's a three-dimensional sketch. And the limitations that are kind of coded into the game, um, it can be useful in that, in that kind of way. Kristen, I was wondering if maybe you could also uh, share your experiences with the project that you were you've been working on. Yeah, I'd be glad to. We we actually haven't started the the workshop phase with block by block yet, um, but what what it has, I think there are two things, and and Tavon can join in by the phone if he's listening by the phone here, and. Um, as well, but I think one is that it's really um, captivated the excitement of the young people who, especially given that it's a skate park, that adds to the excitement of um, and and potential participation of those young people who might not otherwise, you know, get involved with a community planning project, design project. Would you Would you agree, T? Yes, definitely. I mean, like for for Paula and Erika who who's building the bikes. I mean, it's they're really excited about this the idea of participating in like working with Minecraft on its own. You know, like they're really excited because they're young and they're building this stuff, and now they introduce to this new idea and bringing young generation in developing their own community is quite contrasting but quite exciting i guess yeah that's the concept that we, we pushing and that's the idea we're getting that they're very excited as well um, yeah and i also from a standpoint of because the award from un habitat and and minecraft it, or and block by block is is um you know for for a centrally a you know a grant that gets us started and then you know we're, we're going to have to find more funding with um in order to to complete the project especially with the um flood mitigation elements because you know that's going to take uh it's going to it's going to be the expensive parts of the of the project potentially and to have you know, the reality is it leverages um, interest in in potential funders when you say that the project is partnered with block by block and people get really excited about the Minecraft technology. And um, so I think, you know, from that standpoint, it that's another element of it, because as we all know, these you can design all kinds of great projects, but if you can't get the funding, then 
then they don't go anywhere. So um, I think from both of those standpoints, um, they, you know, that that bring brings strengths to the to to the project. Um, I'd be I'd be interested to to and and James and I uh, spoke a little bit about this earlier, but to hear your response, James, about the sort of concerns that are raised in the literature about um, the sort of perpetuating of some of the dynamics of colonialism that are present in the in the Minecraft techno um, the way the game's played. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of kind of valid um, critique of that. And I think it's very important that we don't just hold our hands up and say it's a perfect tool, it's a perfect game. It, it's absolutely not. And we're we're using, we're making it fit to our our purpose as best we can, but it was not designed with this purpose in, in mind. Um, I think maybe my kind of rebuttal of that is a lot of that criticism or critique rests on a, on a certain form of, of the game, which is like a different <laughs> mode of the game. What we're actually doing is kind of extracting the, the, the building blocks of Minecraft, which is about building blocks, right? And kind of we're removing a lot of the, the other context and stuff that comes with it. So a lot of the arguments around kind of Minecraft being a sort of a, a terra nullius or a blank space that, that kids are colonizing, it's, it's fair enough and the original game is about resource extraction but when we run the workshops we don't use that form of minecraft you're not starting from a from scratch you're starting from an existing model um that, that we've created there's nothing to do with resource extraction because we are in a creative mode of the game which kind of removes that so i'd say that the context in which it's being used to you know has a big impact on that and i think also the people who are using it and what approach they bring um, there are limitations and certain biases in the design of the game, the shape of the blocks, the textures that they are, that do have kind of post-colonial issues and connotations, but we can change that and, and we do. So um, yeah, I think it, it's very important to bear in mind and not just pretend that this is the perfect game. I think a lot of academics would rather build a game from scratch, which, which can kind of go around a lot of these issues, the reason that we use Minecraft though is because I think it really helps us because it has such a high profile and the fact that it's actually fun and, and playable and kind of very um, internationally known really helps us with kind of our, um, our kind of engagement and, and general education on the subject. So that's one of the reasons that we're using, we're, we're kind of recontextualizing Minecraft and bringing it into this use rather than building a, a serious game from scratch. Well, and I thought it was interesting too in that in one of those articles, it was critiquing the use of Minecraft in um, in a school in Australia. And, and it also found part of the findings of the study, which I thought were interesting and connecting to what you're saying, is the students' abilities actually, the, the, the study was actually much more critical of the instructors than of the students and the students' ability to sort of really challenge that. And it was actually one of the students who said, but where are the Aborigines in this, in, you know, in this project? And um, so I think I thought that was a very interesting finding of the study and, and a real challenge to us as instructors um, and as leaders of the workshop and so on to, um, you know, the importance of how we approach it. Mm -hmm. Because it's you know you read a a, a a journal article name like that and, and the temptation is to throw the baby out with the bathwater as the saying goes, um, so it was interesting to actually read through that whole article and 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 see the, those findings. I think too just to add to this conversation that um, you know the conversation of accessibility, which you know James had mentioned that it's accessible for people. I think that's a very important component of this, you know, I know that, you know, Minecraft can be played on many devices, um, you know, right down to a smartphone. And so I think that in itself is a very important part. Um, I, you know, I think that, yes, there's a lot of um, components and limitations um, 
that need, you know, maybe the next version of Minecraft, or maybe there's a specific version of Minecraft that could maybe be part of this conversation. Um, but I just, re I, I just kind of recall back when I see my son playing Minecraft, he kind of like devoids himself of um, any of those limitations. And he just kind of creates from his mind and he starts to stir up conversations about architecture itself. And even though both my husband and I are you know, architects, we never really have like deep architectural conversations with our children, um, but he was having them with me. And so I think that in itself was kind of interesting that uh, he was starting to kind of gain a sense of space and then also a sense of um, responsibility for that space, um, which I thought was an important. And then he starts seeing things outside in the real world and talking about it as well. So I think uh, the that's an important part. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've come to the end of some workshops and we've had sort of young kids, seven or eight years old, saying, I never thought I wanted to be an, or I could be an architect or a designer. And this, you know, even just two or three days gives them the, the self-confidence to actually consider that um, as, a, as a career option or as a path they want to pursue. Um, and I think a lot of it is kind of unlocking that, that, that playfulness, which kids naturally have, and they're very good natural designers. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of that is kind of taught out of us <laughs> through whatever education system we have. But um, yeah. going back to play and, and games, kind of a... Uh, a really basic human instinct um, can can help sort of unlock something there. I, I know Tavong wanted to say something about accessibility as well. T, can you unmute yourself and do you want to say something about that? Yeah, okay, guys. So, um, um, for instance, I in a community like Clifton, we we are a community that we don't even have electricity, guys. And sorry, sorry. So we don't even have electricity. It's like, for instance, now now it's low shading, and uh, we have a we have we have a Wi-Fi at nineteen fifty five. So one of our idea is to create a a Wi-Fi spot for the whole community so that everyone can like get access, you know? We've been telling these young boys, I mean, like I've spoken to two of them, Kolani and his friend, and told them, and they've been online and, and seen Minecraft, and they were telling me, ah, this is like pixel games, you know? And okay, that's good, but I'd love to see them get more involved like veronica's son like the way she's talking and then in a community where we don't have an electricity it becomes a bit difficult for everyone that's why we sent with this idea we have sort of like uh we want to create a solar panel table where kids can come in plug in their smartphones for instance and then we have this wi-fi space where everyone can just get access to internet and they can actually do these things rather than you know talking to them and telling them oh, do you know minecraft is like it's nothing they have to experience minecraft you know and i'd love to get we would also love to get much more people involved i mean not just even the kids maybe parents as well maybe because some they can buy their son some data or their family members some data to experience more of this but it's currently in a country where we have a low shading and then in a space like clip town we hardly have power the only i'll be honest with you guys the only access to power here is in we call it easy yoga it's life wires we have to steal electricity so i can be online with you as much as dangerous it's it's our lifestyle that's how we live you know and this is why james uh, i spoke to you and veronica the last time i was telling you the importance of this because this is like it it gives an opportunity to someone who never has anything or they don't have anything i mean i'll tell you something it's not good but 
its effect. Um, two days back, we had the mayor, the mayor of the city. She was around Clifton. She asked some kids who were standing in a corner, what were your dreams or what is it that you want to do? You know, they're like, nah, I want to be a cop. I don't have a dream. Actually. I just want to get myself a house and a car. That's it. You know, with, but with my, bringing Minecraft, it's like literally... I'm hoping it can change other people's life and vision or perspectives as well. You know, that's how, that's why this is important, not just for me, obviously for the community, for my community and the kids in my community, because I'm sure one of them can learn a thing or two out of this and pursue with it further. I don't know if that makes sense, Christina, but that's it. Thanks. Thanks, T. Yeah. Yeah, I think you 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 just beautifully really expressed the reality of um, you know, the sort of bittersweetness of the fact that this is a great opportunity, but you know, the the you still have to have electricity and internet. So um, our our router at 1955 is the only Wi-Fi internet access in the community of Cliptown. So um, yeah. And we had actually talked with James a little bit, uh, maybe about the idea of expanding the project area project to even um, include some uh, capacity building and skills around coding, maybe, or things like that to really develop that side of, of the project. Yeah, and I think this is the area that we struggle with the most, and we need to do a lot of work to to make that happen, um, being conscious of the digital divide and the fact that this opportunity can only exist if we deliver the technology, if we come with, with Minecraft. And um, I think we need to do a lot more to capacity build. Um, but uh, yeah, I think this is one of the reasons this project is so interesting to us. I think it it is a very challenging project, more more challenging than we're used to in terms of the, the, the scope of the site. Um, but I think that makes it all the more kind of um, important for us to, to try and tackle. Yeah. yeah. And again, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier that, you know, when you have a partner like Block by Block, it then becomes easier to get other people on board that can potentially begin to chip away at some of those, uh, at some of those other issues. So, um, and the fact that Block by Block has had a previous successful project with the city of Johannesburg um, as well. Um, and even the fact that the, that, the, that the mayors, that the MMC came to Cliptown was probably largely due to the fact that Tavong had had a very successful meeting with him related to the skate park. So we, so otherwise, you know, so we had his phone number, we had his email, we could contact him directly with images of the flooding and so on. And so, you know, there are all these other ways in which the project actually starts to um, have a life of its own. Apologies, I, I have to go uh, now or in the next minute. Um, yeah, well. Thank you so much, James, for joining us. Um, and I, I know, I think I, I speak for Douglas that we would love to have a further conversation about how, you know, maybe integrating um, some of the technology into the architecture school as well. So, yeah. That'd yes, be great. I, Thank you. I just want to echo what Kristen said. Thank you very much, James, for, for joining us today. And if there, there's, you've raised an awful lot of really interesting issues from about play and all sorts of other things. And if you, if there was a chance to discuss those with you further, we would be delighted because this is a lot of what we're trying to find out about. So thank you though, very much for your time and your effort. Absolutely. No, thanks for having me. Thanks for Bang and Kristen um, for hosting. It's a really, really interesting talk. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks, James. Thanks all. Take care. Thanks, James. Um, James. We could go ahead and if there are any questions from anyone in the audience, if you want to put them either in the chat or just raise your hand um, to ask questions. Uh, 
we'd be happy to either Tabong or Veronica or I to answer them as best we can. Um, as as well, just questions about community community in, involved practice uh, in design or about this project specifically. Um, I am fascinated by by what you guys are doing, but did you did you find that uh, I, I and I'm not an expert on Minecraft, but did you find that the the actual tool itself was uh, limiting in terms of of the ability to create what you wanted? I think it will be. We haven't actually had the Minecraft workshop yet for the project. Um, and so, you know, we've we've talked with James about that and amongst ourselves. And um, I, what do you think, Tavang, what do you think about that? Do you think it's going to be, there's going to be um, a limiting factor as far as the sort of the building blocks of, of Minecraft and how people in the community will be able to engage with those as a tool? Um. Oh, well, I'm always open to new things and learning a lot. So as I hope my community. So for instance, I know in, in Africa, our buildings are not normally our traditional buildings as much as maybe we love to create some traditional buildings, but we pixels or pixels block i think you can create a cycle as well you know depending how you want to present your stuff so i wouldn't say there'll be that much but it's an experience it's an experience of which i'm hoping we can learn from as well other than you know the world is moving on and as much as we're moving on would love to keep our traditional ways of doing things, but yeah, I don't see any challenges or any talking to Kolane. Kolane seemed excited, him and his crew. And they were like, ah, this is like pixels, you know? So it's something they have done before, maybe in a different format, you know? And yeah, I don't see any challenges. I'm not sure if that answers. Do you think also it's there? There's the potential for the fact that you know there'll be people using it. the The way the work the and the way the workshop um, we've we've been has been explained to us is that they come in and and the you know the first the first element of the workshop is is to teach people the basic skills of how to use minecraft which is extremely easy to to use in and um so but for a lot of people who will be there it could potentially be the first time they you know used a computer interacted with it in in any kind of a you know gaming or design way um so also i you know potentially it has the the um, possibility to sort of break down that, you know, the, the intimidation factor of, um, you know, after you to have to go from never having used a computer to having spent a week, uh, you know, two or three days on a computer building a community, then, you know, maybe people be more likely to um, not be quite no. so intimidated. <laughs> Actually, not uh, as much as we don't have computers, people have smartphones, you know, and there's a whole lot of you could do with your smartphones, playing games, researching, designing apps. These phones are literally smart. I mean, your tablets and stuff. I'm sure you can create a whole lot other than like, I know we, I know we're not that computer literacy or have more skills within the computer or programming itself, but smartphones really make 
make stuff easier. Everyone has a smartphone this nowadays. And this is how, for instance, Kulani and their friends, I told them about Minecraft and I was like, okay, maybe we should Google it. And that's how the, the that's how they knew what it, what it was or how simple it was. You know, I'm not sure if that answers. Um, there's a uh, there's a question here saying, do you have any resources for learning to use Minecraft in this way? I've never played it and would love to learn how to use it constructively. Um, Veronica, you might be a good one to answer that question. Yeah. Um, well, I can just see, uh, tell you from what I see from my son there, he, he's never taken a tutorial or a class or anything, but what he does do is watch a lot of YouTube videos. And so the, no matter, uh, whatever he wants to do, he'll just kind of search it out and, and there's usually a YouTube video on it. <laughs> so he has basically learned how to use the program. First of all, by just experimenting with the program, I think that, um, it's a very, uh, easy user interface. Um, and then secondly, um, if he wants to do something a bit more challenging, he'll just search it out online. Um, so I think the first step to do is just to get in it and, and just play around with it. And as far as actually using it in as a com uh, community based design tool in this way, um, part of our of our proposal was that we would um you know share the the process with through through blogging and or vlogging on how this work you know how it actually unfolds in clip town and um you know people's reactions to it and so on so um we will definitely make that available and i can put our website in the chat but we will also make it available on the global studio. But you know, um, I want to maybe build on what Tabong, what Tabong said about uh, smartphones. And uh, I, I've read that by 2025, 72% of the people who are connected to the internet will be only using their smartphones to connect to the internet. That, that of course is a huge number of people. And it actually means that to do exactly what Tabong said would be possible, except for of course, the thing that you also shared with us is that there isn't the infrastructure to connect people to the internet. I, I almost wonder, Kristen and Tabong, whether we should look at a, a follow-on project to the Global Studio, which is focused on creating the kind of infrastructure to create mesh networks in all parts of the world so that people can get a, a connected to the internet. And mesh networks, for those who don't know, are fascinating things. They're really just a series of antennas. Um, and so it doesn't actually cost that much to build these things. And if you can get the internet delivered to one point, a point of presence, you can share it with an entire community. And I, you know, a package that could be put together so that people could do that would be um, really, really critically important. Yeah, we're actually have been talking about the idea of having a mesh network um, here in 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 Cliptown, and for exactly the reasons you're saying, um, and also because you know one of the you know upsides or downsides, depending on where you sit, of the of COVID is so many things have gone online now, even like you know interfacing with government and so on, that it's it's widened that digital divide um, since the end of since the end of COVID. So um, you know for many reasons it would be it would be a really great idea. But but you're but you're right. I mean Douglas, when I do the web design, even now the statistic is that over 50% of people are going to be viewing your website on a phone. So like to, you know, as you're designing to constantly flip back and forth between the desktop, um, how it looks on desktop and how it looks on phone, because otherwise you're, you're really undermining the website if you don't um, design it so that it's viable to use on a phone and easy to use on a phone. Yeah, 
I, I don't want to derail the conversation, but yeah, if we could create a kind of a package that could go into any community, whether it's in Canada or South Africa or any place, it would be a really interesting thing because it doesn't have to be that expensive and we're kind of being diluted by major kind of, you know, telecommunications companies into thinking that it has to be incredibly expensive. Well, that was one of the interesting things in the um, rural, I'm sorry, my mind's gone blank, the, the name of the rural um, development uh, initiative that we're part of in, in the series of talks that, that was in September, one of them was about somebody who is doing mesh network networks on many of the reserves that have inadequate um, infrastructure. So it's in Canada. Um, all right, well, are there, are, are there, um, and if there are any other questions, and Douglas, you also had wanted to say something at the start of the talk, and so we'll let you say it at the end of the talk instead. Well, well first of all, I'd to just thank everybody, and, and I, um, I really, I really enjoyed this talk because I think it's incredibly important. There's so many issues raised that I'd like to continue talking about. The role of play in design is a, is a critical one. But I, for um, before everybody leaves, there's two things. Uh, Veronica has been working on a equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, survey. And I'm, I'm going to ask if she could put um, that link into the, the chat. We're trying to connect with design students around the world. Um, and so if you haven't filled out the survey, we'd really appreciate it if you did. And so that would be great. Um, we're also, I, I suspect, we're kind of coming to the end of this incarnation of the global studio. We have just a little bit of money left. The project's supposed to end by February. I hope that we can do a big wrap up event and invite everybody. But I just wanted to this, you know, note of appreciation to all of those who have uh, uh, helped out so much and Kristen in particular, but Veronica has been a frequent uh, uh, presenter and so is Tabang actually. And so we really are appreciative of that. Uh, the other, the last thing I'll simply add is that um, we are now in the process of trying to develop our online master's program and get it accredited. We're going to face a lot of hurdles to doing that. I don't want to divert this, this meeting, but if you're interested in helping us, um, we could use help because we're going to have to reach out to a lot of people in order to get approvals and accreditation. But it's an absolutely essential initiative because we are trying to help people become architects who have no other way to do it. They can't stop what they're doing and go full-time to an architecture school. We think this has not just Canadian implications, but global implications as well to really open up the profession. And we're now starting to move towards the idea of radical inclusion. And the Global Studio is actually a, a, a big part of that. How do we connect with people around the world? So you, stay tuned. It's gonna be an interesting next few months as we kind of do this, but if you have, if you want to work with us, um, we are always happy to be to working with everybody. So, um, but again, thank you to everybody who, oh. who's done so much. We'll definitely have to have a wrap up event though, Kristen, before the end of February. Absolutely, and I think that the um, that um, Tabang and the kids from Cliptown participating in the global studio. Um, uh, towards a cross-cultural sketching school when we had the kids in Cliptown participating in the sketching school through the architecture program, I think is a great example of that idea of radical inclusion. Yeah, and the-, the... Matt, Akras, can I say something? Please, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to say like, um, you know, including kids from Cliptown in the drawing session. It's like, it's been a life-changing moment for, for them, you know, like, yeah, it's been great for them. Like have, having this experience from professionals talking or listening to them of in how things are done or how it's been a really life-changing experiment. And I'm sure you, you have seen the attendance or the, the those kids like, the excitement in the images itself, you know? And that's an experience I love. And that's what I, I wanna see, bringing change, you know, in, 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 in this community and these kids and for them being part of the, 
conversation or part of the discussion. It's been really great and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, T. You know, it, it's so it's so sad. It was also so obvious that we should have done this. The idea of, you know, it's also uh, the concept of, of being kind of creating, trying to create a gift culture where people share things. Um, and if we, you know, if we'd only been a little bit brighter to recognize when we when we saw the reaction of young people getting these sketching packs, you go, it's almost something like we should be doing all the time. We, we've got to figure out a way to do that. And it was very nice of the, the group in um, uh, in Kelowna, Opus, to really give us a discount on this. We'll have to figure out ways to do this again. And, and whether we get, no matter what happens with the Global Studio, we have to keep doing this stuff. We have to keep people drawing and we have to keep them connected to resources and to the sharing aspect of this. So we're kind of committed no matter what happens, because frankly, to get those drawing kits, you know, it, it, let's, I think they were maybe $27 a piece. If, if everyone on this call, you know, put in $27, that would be nine, 10 more kids that could be drawing. And so um, we liked, you know, obviously we, we're, we enjoy it when the, the government provides us with some funding, but it's also something we could just do. Yeah, yeah. And if you have any more pictures, though, Tabang, of people using the, the the tools, please share them because this could be really helpful as we as we do move forward and we ask we look for other grants as well. No, definitely, I'll do that. Um, I'm I'm sure they've been drawing. I mean, some they were telling me their sketchbooks are already <laughs> full, so they needed sketchbooks, so that's why I didn't go to them, but. I'll go and take more pictures. They've been drawing and yeah, and I've seen like one Dumi. Dumi does some great artichokes, some awesome stuff. And I was like, nah, Christine needs to see this and I'll definitely send them to you guys. Please. For sure. All right. Well, if there's if there's nothing further, um, we will uh, say good night from my side. Good morning to the, to the rest of the day for your side. And um, happy holidays to everybody. And we'll see you back in January. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Stay safe. Yes. Enjoy, care. everyone, and keep safe. Yeah, thanks, but especially to Tabong and Veronica for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to everyone. Thanks, Veronica. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, James. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Veronica, have a have a great holiday. Bye. You as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.